start in with knowing that we're here uh, to, to have a personal conversation on subjectivity. Um, we're going to familiarize ourselves with subjectivity since we all have our own individual moment by moment, as we just learned. Um, and I'd like to pose a question to y'all. So you've got two minutes, minor, 20 seconds, give or take. And I know that's going to be challenge. So I'm going to be I'm going to be ca uh, counting. I have a leather strap that has no timer, so you guys are off pressure. Wait, but I, I, was, I thought you were going to stop that I have a leather strap. Can I, <laughs> I take that as a threat or a promise? Oh, we're going there. Okay. So I have a leather strap and I know how to use it. And uh, and if you could take two minutes or so, um, what do you mean? What do we mean when we say subjectivity or subjective experience? What, what, what do you mean, and how would you demonstrate it? And I'd like to start with Jay, please. <laughs> well, I, th I think that, you know, it's, it's a, a word that has uh, different meanings for different people in that sense. It's uh, self-referentially um, subjective. But I think it's this uh, idea of, of being aware of, of being me in terms of the, the self-awareness um, aspect, in, in terms of looking at the world um, from my perspective as an, an individual person. Could you elaborate a little bit? Um, you have one more minute. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, for my world is developmental in terms of, and so one way I'd look at this is when would that occur in terms of as a baby in the womb thinking like, you know, I'm little Jay, you know, like the world around me, like the amniotic fluid and stuff like that. Or uh, if not in the womb, at what point in life do we first have the sensation of being us, you know, in terms of knowing that we're uh, mm. an individual person. And, and where that line is crossed, I, that has, you know, including octopus or other animals, you know, in terms of at, at what point in terms of our brain development are the brains capable of this um, sensation of being self-aware. Um, and so, um, like you mentioned, neural architecture and you know, connectivity is a big part of this as well in terms of as the brain matures, it doesn't mature by getting larger and larger, it matures by becoming more interconnected. And I think that the, the key to consciousness, so to speak, will be in understanding how these connections. And if the different brain parts are like letters of the alphabet, to A, B, C, C, at some point they become connected into words and then those words into sentences. And so you, a sentence like, uh, there was an old woman who lived in a shoe. <laughs> is that a story? Or uh, it depends on how we define a story. She lived in my shoe. Uh, yes, yeah. but at, at some level, whether, however arbitrary it is, we'll say there's a, a sufficient number of sentences and stuff that that's a story. And I think that's what consciousness is like. There, there'll be a certain degree of interconnectedness in the brain that will cross the threshold where we could say, now those letters have become words, have become sentences, have become a story, and that's when consciousness emerges. When we can have sufficient memory, connectivity, um, references to the world around us and the world within us, then this notion of what we call subjectivity or consciousness, um, that is the uh, necessary neural components of it, is not the individual structures, but how they're connected. Connected. Okay, great. Okay. All right. And yes. to sort of just, I'm sorry, just to briefly add. Is this to part that. of your two minutes? I'll count. <laughs> yeah, I'll count. So, so just to sort of add to what Jay said, um, an important aspect of this is what you might call the privileged nature of subjective experience. That is to say, you are you, and I have no direct access to the units of you. This is, you are absolutely unique, and there's no way that I could possibly experience the world the way you experience the world, however well or however much you try to communicate that to me. You know, the thing that will militate against my ever understanding exactly your unis, your experience as you, is the fact that you have a unique experience. You, you literally experience the world, and you have a unique history. The history is unique to you, and I don't share it. You know, I may share aspects in some way, shape, or form, but think about that, really. There's no way, based on my perception, the way I'm built, even I'm a human like Jay is, but my eyes are a little different. I see the world somewhat differently. There's no way that I could possibly have an identical experience. So the Jayness of Jay is unique to Jay. It's private, it's privileged, and that, I think, is really important. And that's something, in fact, that my father emphasized. The other aspect, I know I'm getting... Close to two. It's a, scienti um, it's a scientist's version of two minutes. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Relative. <laughs> it's, it's two minutes on Jupiter. Okay. So, so 
the point about it is that uh, it, you know, this was an important aspect of my dad's feeling about the nature of consciousness, but also I should add the interactive nature of the conscious experience. That is to say, it's the connections, but it's also the selection by the world and by your own individual history of those connections that strengthen versus the ones that aren't selected for and simply weaken, or in the case during development, maybe even retract and the connections will die off or even some cells die. So. Excellent. Thank you very much. Jeff, I would love to hear from you. Oof. It's hard to follow that up. Actually, um, I've had a subjective experience now hearing David talk right. and actually bring up one of my favorite jokes. Uh, um, but in, and there was a whole catalog of jokes that, that your father had. And it brings back the, just all these memories, including the Beethoven joke he always told. Um, and I think that's a big part of the experience. Uh, memories, how you build memories, how they shape what you are, your experience, uh, how you can use those memories to kind of do mental time travel, to work through those memories, to actually plan for the future, I think is a very important part of it. How like you develop values through your lifetime that actually shape those memories. And given a certain time point in your life, those values actually shape how you work through your memories, things like that. And then there's, there's also, I, I really don't deal with consciousness, I will, well, at least besides my own, but, um, but uh, there, there's some other ideas that, like theory of mind, when, when, uh, when David was talking about the J-ness of J, and there's the David-ness of David, but you know, I, I, I know I'm conscious and I have this theory that David and J are conscious, and I can put myself into their shoes and, and be empathetic. Um, and I think that's empathy is a very important part of it, especially of social creatures like, like us as human beings. And that, that's another part of leading to, I guess, what you guys would call the that's subjective lovely. experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just real quick. Yes, Jay. And so oh. even wondering if, if oh. that is part of the adaptive nature of consciousness, just as you said, like I can be able to put ourselves in other shoes that, that can um, enhance our chance of survival because we can anticipate threats and alliances and such. Yeah. So it could be you know, something actually useful to be conscious. Well, yeah, and that goes back to, I mean, the whole theory, neurodarwinism was Darwinism and selection and survival of the fittest. And if you're in social groups, to be able to figure out what the other people in your society and your group are doing and what that means and maybe how to get ahead or, or how to work with them, that's very important. So you see not just humans, but other animals that, that are, are group related that, that have uh, empathy, sympathy, and, and maybe theory of mind. I and mean, that's still an open question. Lovely. I'm going to ask Mark Mitten for you to fill two minutes, please. All, All right. right. I'll try to fill this yeah. into this. Um, see, for, from a magician standpoint, of course, this, <laughs> right, it kind of doesn't make sense, this stuff, right? Because we, you know, what I talked to Dr. Edelman about was, you know, we tried a bunch of, you know, like I did tricks for you, some, you know, for some of you before this started, and I try some stuff, and it works or it doesn't, right? So you're kind of in this selective environment. When cognitive psychologists talk about magic, they often talk about, like, there's only one possible outcome, whereas any working magician knows tricks don't work sometimes, right? Sometimes they, and sometimes a great trick under one set of conditions isn't as terrible in another sense. So, you know, and like when I first met cognitive psychologists and they were talking about theory of mind or how we envision the mind of someone else and Jayness and Davidness and Jeffness and Brynianness, um, it gets all really complicated. But what I, I access the same thing by asking parents, you know, I, I'm not a parent, but you know, when I ask parents, because they were telling me that, you know, the, the cognitive psychologists were telling me that that didn't really happen until three and a half, the age of three and a half. And I'd ask parents, when did your kid first work you? Right? <laughs> and they all, it was like, it's like, it's almost, you know, like nobody can nail it, but it's like a lot earlier than, than three and a half. It turns out that that was a measuring limit. They were trapped in this verbal world of asking questions. So, you know, the kids at three and a half have a verbal limitation between three and a half and four, but it has nothing to do with their, you know, the way we work each other, right? So, so and, and tricks and jokes and ahas, you know, whether we listen to music and we go, wow, or we hear a joke and we laugh or not, um, or, or I do a trick and you react or not, you know, we have a lot of information. So the subjective and objective kind of in that space kind of go away because either a connection is being made, we're aligning and coupling as people in foveated eye contact research or the way we 
look at each other and either zoom in and connect or not. We all know this as human beings, right? So even like in these discussions right now, we're connecting or we're not. So, uh, and you score or you don't. And, and, you know, we all know this from interacting. So I think in that, this is the kind of thing that I talked about with Dr. Edelman, which was highly selective, obviously, because we try a bunch of stuff, it works or it doesn't. That's a lot like Darwin's idea. Uh, you know, that, that nature tries some stuff, it works or it doesn't. And indeed, some people talk about nature like there isn't sloppiness. Like things all work out. The way he was talking about those films and a lot of stuff ending up on the cutting room floor, we've all heard those people. It's like the people, like I was, like I joke, like, because I work at a lot of fancy events, right? So there's a kind of social life. If I, you know, if a person talks about a party, like it's going to go well, then I know they haven't thrown many parties. <laughs> it just means that they don't know reality. It has nothing to do with, they have a good theory of parties, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> so can I ask you a question? So sure. Part of selectionism might be uh, the way you actually approach magic, right? Because it's making people select and attend to something and divert their attention. Well, you just said magic words, because when psychologists talk about it, yeah. they always talk about attention control as if confusion isn't part of it. Yeah. And when I go back to the family model, when kids are working you, and you're talking to them, and they, you know that they know that you know that you ended up, but then they can act confused and mess it all up. And they know it. But somehow psychologists didn't get the memo that people also fool people with confusion. Because they're so focused on attention and these certain and predictive models that Jerry couldn't understand, right? So yeah, and, and, and then we can also go into causal structures. You know, sometimes things happen for multiple reasons, you know? So if somebody's talking about causality in a simplistic way, I know it would drive your dad nuts, right? And, and then also, um, things like uh, magical feelings, right? So we go into the social space, because really, no big secret, I'm talking about mind, body, and spirit. Just don't tell scientists that, because they freak out, right? <laughs> so, um, so in, you know, because we have, we have the cognitive mind, and you can tell you're in uh, the world of ideas because the information is simple, the causal is A, B, A causes B. When you, you go into the physical world and the social world, if you're not talking about complexity, you're not in the world.